night, guys. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Uh, I hope the weather's nice wherever you're at. Sure isn't up here in New England. Uh, I understand Obama today uh, issued sections of New England as national disaster areas. Uh, the flooding is already starting in some areas, and uh, it's going to continue to do this up until at least uh, Friday. Friday's supposed to be the next uh, non-rain day that we have, so uh, I'm sure the Bankster boys are rubbing their hands together with glee as the billions of federal dollars pour in, and they wreak tremendous profits. Unbelievable. Uh, anyway, uh, and this is on top of flooding that we already had, like, what, a week and a half ago? We had, like, four or five days straight. Not to mention last year. Oh, this is deja vu. Last uh, uh, June, this, just, just this past June, it rained, like, six weeks straight. The whole month of June, literally, non-stop, every single day. I forgot what color the sky was. Uh, it, it rained uh, the whole month of June and two weeks into July. It was just phenomenal. This is not normal weather. Anyway, i uh, got a good show lined up for you today. I'm going to pick up with uh, part two of what I started yesterday, uh, talking about the Virginia Tech shootings. Uh, and really, you know, this needs to be viewed in light of what I discussed last week uh, about Columbine. Um, you know, the, you, you, once you see this pattern, folks, uh, there's just no question what we're dealing with here. Columbine was a complete fraud. We were lied to about everything that happened there. It was a total psyops. And uh, when you see the pattern at Virginia Tech, the same exact pattern, lo and behold, uh, it, you know, it, it's just business as usual. And uh, that's been the case with a great many other school shootings, not only around this country, but in fact around the world. Uh, there was one in Scotland a few years back. Uh, Canada has had their share. And some people say, oh, it's the copycat syndrome. Well, yeah, it is. All the intelligence agencies around the world come out of the woodwork and say, hey, it's working great for them. <laughs> Let's try it over here, too. You know, the same thing with the fake terror attacks, the fake terror alerts. Remember, uh, what was his name? John Howard, former uh, Australian prime minister, saw how well the fake orange alerts were working over here. He pulled the same thing over there in Australia. I think it was... Uh, November of 2004 or 2005, I forget what year it was now, but uh, there was a sleazy piece of uh, so-called anti-terror legislation that uh, Pretty Boy Howard was trying to get passed through Parliament. It wasn't flying. So, surprise of all surprises, the next day the little scoundrel uh, issues a terror alert. And, of course, in wake of the terror alert, Parliament voted the piece of legislation in. And then later when asked, you know, what's this uh, orange alert, or not orange alert, but, you know, terror alert, what's this terror alert based upon? And he says, oh, I can't go into the details. It's a matter of national security. Uh, but don't worry, it's from highly credible sources. Unbelievable. So, you know, it's a copycat syndrome. They did the same thing here, folks. Steering us uh, with phony orange alerts, uh, you know, and, and exploiting them to the hilt. All right, guys, short break. We'll just be right back talking about the Virginia Tech fraudulent PSYOP shootings. Smoke in the hallways. The CIA is at it again. Virginia Tech, guys, another flippin' fraud. You know, it's not a question of which... Uh, tragic events uh, have government fingerprints on them. It's a question of which ones don't have government fingerprints on them. In fact, I have a list here of all the major travesties that have occurred in this country's history that have not had the government's fingerprints on them. You want to hear it? Here it is. And that's it. I hope you wrote that down. Those are all of the instances that, uh, tragic instances that have occurred that didn't have government fingerprints on them. Anyway, before I launch into that, I just wanted to mention uh, I'm going to be talking about Virginia Tech Part 2, the first hour. Uh, that should be enough time to finish up these notes. And then uh, the second hour, uh, I'm going to be having a guest if the moon is lined up with Venus and Sagittarius. <laughs> you just never know. I'm assuming my guest is going to show up. Uh, 
but who knows? No, th- he's a pretty, uh, he's a respectable guy. If he doesn't, it's because something major came up. Uh, it's uh, William Pepper. For those of you that are not familiar with him, uh, he's an interesting individual. He's had some, uh, well, he's written some great books, had some interesting experiences. Uh, he's He serves currently as Sir Hans, Sir Hans' lawyer, the alleged, and I do mean alleged, assassin of uh, RFK. Uh, he's written a book on the uh, assassination of Martin Luther King, uh, implicating, of course, the FBI, the CIA, and that hit. Uh, he's currently involved in an in investigation, uh, or should I say, uh, uh, efforts of a prosecution of uh, George W. and his criminal cabal uh, being launched out of Spain. He's involved in that. Um, we're going to be talking about those and other issues. Who knows where... Uh, that conversation will lead, but it'll be interesting. So uh, I'm anticipating he's going to be calling in the second hour. Uh, really nice guy, though. I've interviewed him before. There's some interesting uh, information. Anyway, for now, let's pick up with uh, part two of yesterday's discussion. Uh, yesterday, I kind of laid the groundwork. Uh, already dropped some hints of stuff I was going to be covering today, but basically what I covered yesterday was just uh, pretty much the official story, what we were told about what happened, uh, you know, which already doesn't add up. Uh, we had Cho, you know, shooting a couple kids in a dorm uh, early in the morning, and then, you know, a couple hours go by, and then he goes into part two of his shooting spree, uh, during that two-hour interval, we're told that, you know, he filmed himself, took some pictures of himself, and then he mailed them to NBC News uh, to be aired later. And um, all this time, nothing was done uh, to stop him. Uh, it's just unbelievable. It's the same thing with Columbine, of course. We had uh, Klebold and Harris, the only two shooters. Yeah, whatever. Uh, going on for hours on end. In that case, uh, the shooting continued long after the time, several hours after the time, according to the official story, that Klebold and Harris had shot themselves. How's that possible? Boy, you talk about coming back from the dead. Uh, these ghosts were able to still fire their guns, I guess. That's amazing. Wow. Uh, but anyway... You know, you got to wonder, just on, on that basis alone, how is this official story possible? How are we supposed to believe it when the shootings go on for hours on end? How was he able, to, you know, Cho, how was he able to do this? And how were Klebold and Harris able to do what they did? Uh, even if they weren't, you know, supposedly shot uh, at 1210 and the shootings went on until almost 4 o'clock that afternoon, even if they were still alive all that time, how could they have pulled it off? without police intervention. It's just incredible. SWAT teams swarming the place. Um, but uh, as it turns out, that's not the only problem. There are many, many, many more problems with the official story, both of Columbine and uh, Virginia Tech. But again, we already looked at the Columbine thing last week. Now we want to look at some more of these problems with Virginia Tech. Uh, but already I hope you can see, based on what I said yesterday, that it's, it's just not possible. But uh, with the evidence we're going to be looking at now, uh, I think you're going to agree with me that uh, Cho either didn't uh, do any of the shootings or he was not the only perpetrator of, uh, you know, of this travesty. There were others involved. But uh, I have good reason to believe, folks, that he wasn't even involved at all. He was set up as the patsy um, and uh, actually had nothing to do with it. But his profile fit the bill. You know, he had a, a history of psychological problems, so he seemed like the perfect person to set up uh, as the perpetrator. Anyway, let's look at some uh, some other problems with this official bunk story. In order to shoot so many shots accurately with both guns in his hands, uh, Joe would uh, um, would have to have been a professional shooter, folks. He would have to be. Yet Cho never had any training for such accurate shooting ever his entire life, 23-year life. Uh, it's difficult to fire even one gun with accuracy in such rapid succession. Cho had only bought his guns 
a month before the spree. So how did he pull this off? By the way, uh, we're, several uh, people who, who knew Cho said that he bought the guns for somebody else and he buy them for himself. Uh, there's all kinds of problems, you know, regarding the, the, the purchase of the guns. And uh, anyways, get into that later. But, uh, you know, how do you, uh, how does someone with no training, apparently never even shot a gun before, uh, in, in just, you, you know, one uh, one month's time, how does he develop these skills now, these shooting skills, where he can uh, accurately point, uh, aim, and shoot two guns at once? It's hard, you know, to do that with even one gun uh, in rapid succession. Boom, 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 boom. You know, the, the shots are being fired, you know, back to back. Uh, but think about it. There are 10 to 15 rounds in a pistol, and there were 32 deaths with three shots in most of the victims. Three shots each. So we're dealing with almost 100 shots being fired, and those are the ones that uh, actually hit victims. Uh, but, you know, these were accurate shots being fired. Uh, most of them did hit the victims. Uh, three bullets each for, for most of the victims. Uh, that, that, that's quite a, quite a record. Uh, with a pistol in each hand, it's very difficult to reload. And yet, as it turns out, shots were constantly being fired while he had guns in each hand. How was he able to reload these guns so quickly and fire the guns so accurately, again, with one gun in each hand? You know, nobody stops to think about this stuff. It's like 9-11, you know, nobody stops to think, well, wait a minute, how is it possible to fly around for a total of almost uh, two hours in four airplanes, head toward Washington for 40 minutes without an intercept or a shoot down after the two towers in New York had been hit. Nobody stops to think about this stuff. Is it even possible? And you realize these pilots didn't even have training. The, the hijacker pilots didn't have good training. Their own instructors said they were horrible pilots. Anyway, guys, short break. We'll be right back. All right, guys. Welcome back. Looking at... Uh, Bizarre inconsistencies with the official story of the Virginia Tech shooting, just as there was with the uh, Columbine shooting. Emily uh, Hilscher was said to be Cho's girlfriend. This is another part of the official story that just doesn't pan out. Uh, this was absolutely not true. In fact, uh, Emily was not related to Cho in any way, uh, and yet he made it a point to go to her dormitory and kill her, and nobody knows why. Why did he go out of his way? She had no contact with him, no relationship with him at all. Why did he go out of his way just to target her? You know, another one or two, I think, died in the process, uh, but it was her that he primarily uh, had gone after. Uh, it, you know, there's just a lot of things that don't add up here. Cho's body had two shots in the chest, I mentioned this yesterday, and one in the back of the head. Uh, does this sound like a suicide? Does it sound like he killed himself? Interestingly, most of the victims who were killed that day, as I stated, uh, were also shot three times, just like Cho. Uh, it just uh, it doesn't add up, folks. This sounds like somebody else doing the shootings who did have uh, training who did uh, have, you know, uh, uh, good shooting skills so that he could hold two guns at the same time and reload quickly. Joe didn't have the ability to do this. And this uh, trained shooter, uh, you know, ensured that his victims were dead by shooting them three times. Apparently, uh, Cho as well shot three times. Again, folks... It, you can't commit suicide by shooting yourself three times, once in the head, twice in the chest. And don't forget, the shot in the head was in the rear of the head, as I mentioned yesterday. Uh, you, you know, you never hear of people shooting themselves in the rear of the head. You commit suicide, you're going to go for what's easy, uh, what's convenient. Uh, you know, shooting yourself in the rear of the head is just, it's almost impossible for most people to even reach behind there and get a good angle. It's just very awkward. 
Um, and the bullet wound wasn't consistent with uh, a shot being fired at close range. It was more consistent with one shot from a distance, uh, you, you know, in, in the head. Uh, so, you know, obviously, just on that basis alone, this story crumbles like uh, every other government story that we're fed. But I, I don't think they care that this story doesn't add up because they know that most people are going to buy it. They're never going to look into it. They're never even going to think to question it, that there's any reason to question it, because after all, El Governamente said, why question El Governamente? They wouldn't lie to us. Oh, no, no, they never do. Anyway, uh, there was actually no witness to the alleged suicide of Cho. That's another important point to bring out. Uh, this is all what we are told. Again, uh, just like 9-11. People just go by what they're told. They were told that there were 19 hijackers. Uh, they were told that Flight 77 hit the Pentagon. They were told that Flight 93 crashed in Shanksville. Told this, told that. They were told that the buildings collapsed because of thermal expansion. <laughs> ah, that's got to be the biggest joke of all. Thermal expansion, my fat behind. My behind isn't fat, by the way, but <clears throat> anyway... Uh, so, moving on here, uh, one witness to the killing said that the killer did not have Asian-looking eyes. This testimony, of course, was completely ignored. They only pay attention to testimonies, or put in the record, testimonies that jive with the official story, just like the Kennedy assassination. No, there was no one behind the grassy knoll. You know, I talked about Flight 93 a couple of weeks ago and how the FBI was telling witnesses, no, there was no other plane in the area. Uh, but, sir, we saw a military plane. Nope, nope, you didn't see it. There was nothing else there. Sir, we did see it. It flew overhead. It was very close. Uh, no, no, it wasn't there. And so those stories never got written down. We only know about them because a couple local papers carried those stories, but it never made it into the national news. Oh, I don't know, America, when are you going to snap out of it? You should have snapped out of it a long time ago. You know, when they pulled off the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, that should have been your wake-up call. I mean, uh, you know, they had been trying to pull off something like that for over 100 years, going back to 1791, as a matter of fact, uh, with the First Bank of the United States, and then 1816, or, or 1812, I should say, uh, when they renewed the charter, for the second bank of the, uh, uh, no, I had it right the first time. The, <laughs> the first charter ran out in 1812. The second charter was renewed in 1860. Anyway, um, you know, the first bank, the second bank of the United States, those were early attempts at a central bank in this country. Uh, you, you know, you had people like Thomas Jefferson speaking out against it. Andrew Jackson spoke out against it. In fact, caught a couple bullets in the head because of it, but uh, amazingly survived. They tried to kill him. They didn't succeed. But, uh, you know, he shut them down in 1836, the second bank in the United States. Uh, they tried it under Lincoln. Lincoln resisted him. We know what happened to him. They tried it under Garfield. Garfield resisted. We know what happened to him. They tried it under McKinney, uh, McKinley. McKinley resisted him. We know what happened to him. You know, I mean, look at the, the long history here. It's obvious what was going on. And yet just a few short years later in 1913, they were at it again. This time they succeeded. The American public was snoozing right through that and has been snoozing ever since. The Federal Reserve Act, uh, you know, was only the first step, but a very important step. And, you know, that's how they were able to pull off all the other stuff that they, they pulled off. They had to be able to pick up pockets to finance all of their other escapades. But uh, because we didn't wake up to that, because we didn't put a stop to that, we've gotten all these other fiascos. They sucked us into World War I, World War II, the fraudulence of the Cold War, uh, all these bureaucracies in Washington that, that they've created, none of these things would have been possible without the Federal Reserve to create these huge, you know, bloated budgets. Before the Federal Reserve, they were limited to how much they could spend uh, because you were on the gold standard. You know, they couldn't spend more than what they had in reserves. But now with the Federal Reserve in place, uh, th th there's no limit. There's no limit whatsoever. And... Uh, America, you, you've just been sleeping for too long. I just marvel, you know, at the ignorance of people when you talk about things like this. Uh, you know, 9-11 being inside job, Columbine, uh, you know, Virginia Tech. People just, you look at you like you got antennas sticking out of your head. But shame on them. 
Shame on us for not being aware of what's been going on in this country right in their face. It's not, you know, hidden in a back room. This stuff is done right out in the open. And the, the, the problems with the official stories always are major, right? You know, like a dog just ready to bite your head off. You can't miss this stuff. But almost everybody does. It's unbelievable. Anyway, let's move on with... Uh, our topic at hand here. Look at some more problems with the Virginia Tech shooting. There's no end to them. Uh, no one saw the killer's face. The whole time the shooting spree was going on, nobody saw his face. He was wearing a mask, eyewitnesses said. He was also said to be about six feet tall with a large build. Yet Cho was only five feet eight inches tall and was not of a large build. So there you go. Was this Cho pulling off the shootings? Doesn't look like it now, does it? Nobody saw him. Nobody could positively like, positively identify him. And don't forget, uh, at least one witness got a very close look at him and said he didn't have Asian-looking eyes. Okay? And... Um, we got a break coming in. Stick with us, folks. I'll get to some more major inconsistencies with this fraudulent story when we get back. All right, guys. Well, we're already a half hour uh, in broadcast. i got to get moving here if I want to finish up these notes. Well, if I don't, I'll finish them whenever. Probably Thursday, because tomorrow i got a guest for the full two hours. Anyway, the gun vendor where Cho uh, had, had bought the guns, described Cho simply as an Asian, but there were no security camera pictures taken of him, no evidence that it was actually him buying the guns. So there you go. How do you like that? How do you like that? We don't even know if Cho actually bought the guns. The killer had erased the code on the guns. Uh, the receipt for the purchase of the guns was found in the killer's bag, in Cho's bag. Isn't that interesting? What are the chances of the killer keeping the receipt uh, for a month after the purchase, uh, keeping it at all, let alone having it uh, conveniently in his bag at the time of the killings? This sounds like planted evidence to me, folks. Uh... If enough care was taken to remove the code on the guns, it seems even more unlikely that the receipt would be kept, and certainly that it would be kept in the bag itself. Does that does that make sense? You know, this is like the, uh, the miraculous passport being found a block away from ground zero, later in the debris. Oh, that wasn't planted evidence now, was it? The entire plane was swallowed up. Uh, when it struck the North Tower. Uh, you know, the, the huge explosion, that whole plane was incinerated, and yet we're supposed to believe that a fragile piece of paper flew out and landed blocks away, intact, hardly even singed. <laughs> ah, you got to be kidding. My personal favorite with 9-11 is the Muhammad Atta bag. I uh, mentioned this on previous broadcasts, but conveniently, of all the bags checked in on 9-11, it was the only one that didn't make its flight and was just uh, waiting there for the FBI when they showed up later so they could go through it and then make claims later that they found this and that. Uh, keep changing their story. Oh, by the way, did we mention we also found this and found that? You know, right after they found the bag, uh, they published a list of all the items that were in it, and then uh, almost five years later, they added a, a something else to it. They said, oh, yeah, well, there was also a list of all the hijackers' names. That's where we got the hijackers' names from. When initially they said they got them from the passenger manifest list, but they weren't on the passenger manifest list. I mean, you know, oh, man. Unless you study this stuff carefully, you, you, you can't even begin to imagine just how much you're being lied to. But, you, you know, when you carefully watch events like this unfold over the years, you take notes, and then you consult those notes later when something else happens... You, you just, you gawk with amazement that the public can buy this crap. Absolute amazement, because the lies are just through the roof. And they continue to tell the same kind of crappy lies 
and make the same blooming mistakes in, in their little psyops operations, and, and, and that people don't see this is just, uh, it's astonishing. Anyway, none of the uh, witnesses to the killings uh, at uh, Virginia Tech mention the killer wearing or carrying any bag of any kind. Now, isn't that a kick in the head? We're told that the gun uh, purchase receipt was in his bag, but yet when he was going through the school, or whoever it was going through the school doing the shootings, this killer was not uh, touting a bag at all, wasn't carrying one, didn't have one on his back. Do you see the problems with this story? Let's go on now to talk about the video that he allegedly sent, uh, you know, to NBC. Uh, it was not made by Cho, folks. Because of the uh, editing job and the multiple camera angles, it keeps jumping from this angle to that angle. Even the New York Times pointed this out, that it didn't look like the video was made by Cho. Somebody else had to be shooting it for him. Uh, did he even have time to do the editing? You know, when you're in a rush, you just kill some people. You don't want to take a chance that you're going to get caught. Uh, you're not going to be able to take the time to, to do editing and, uh, you know, fiddle with the camera, fuss with it, and change its angle from this angle to that. No, 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 no. You're in a hurry. You want to get on to your next killing, right? And yet, you know, this tape looks like it was made with some degree of care. There was editing done, and the camera angles, again, kept changing. It's, it's obvious that this film wasn't even shot. Uh, the same day. Or if it was, he got up very early in the morning and shot it before the killing spree even began. Um, but there's other problems on the tape. Cho was not expressing hateful emotions to match the hateful words that he was speaking on the tape. He wasn't speaking with anger. He was kind of, you know, just... Um, he seemed almost emotionless. And, of course, he was reading off of a sheet was he coerced or perhaps threatened into doing this? You know, read from this sheet as we record you or we're going to kill your family. You know, whatever. Who knows? The guy did have mental problems. He was probably a, an easy target for something like this. But clearly, folks, he wasn't speaking out of anger or revenge. There was no emotion. You can go, go look at the videos for yourself. They're all over the Internet. You, you don't see that anger in his voice matching the words that he's speaking. It was done very uh, casually, almost. Cho also claimed on the tape to be the victim of persecution at the school, but there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that he suffered any form of victimization, either at school or anywhere else. He acted like, you know, finally you're going to get yours now for what you've done to me. There's no evidence that he was ever picked on or, or made fun of. Nothing. Called names. Absolutely no evidence whatsoever. All that going on is that uh, incident in 2005, you know, where he was stalking a couple girls. And then he was, uh, in fact, I'm going to talk about that next year in my notes. Uh, as mentioned, Cho was referred to a mental health facility in 2005 over this, you know, the stalking incident. A Virginia court described Cho as, quote, uh, an imminent threat to himself and others, and ordered him to seek mental treatment. However, documents obtained by ABC News show that Cho was released only one day after being committed, and that uh, even though a physician at the facility agreed that Cho was uh, mentally ill, he certified that he was, quote, not a threat to himself or others. So which is it? We've been told that, oh, yeah, a court said he was a serious threat to himself and society, blah, blah, blah. But the physician who examined him at the mental health facility released him only a day later and said that he was not a threat to himself or others. Yes, he had mental problems, but he was not a threat. Uh, so you've got to ask, was the state of Cho's mental health exaggerated? Uh, so that he would fit the bill as the crazed madman who solely told off the Virginia Tech shootings? Uh, it sort of looks that way to me, folks. According to the police, the gun at the incident was automatic. And yet, the pictures of him show him holding two, uh, you know, handguns. They weren't automatics. According to uh, the testimony of one student, Cho had no friends whatsoever. Yet a few days before the incident, he was with two other Americans. Who were they? 
according to the news and the tape allegedly sent by Cho to NBC, uh, he committed this crime out of hate for rich people. But if this were true, he could have simply uh, stuck with shooting students in the classrooms. So why did he go to the dormitory and shoot two students there uh, who were not rich and affluent? Why single them out? Again, folks, it doesn't add up. These stories are designed for the gullible masses that don't think, that don't look at the lumps under the rug, that don't even notice the lumps at all. Uh, but when you do, in fact, notice those lumps and look under the rug, always these stories crumble to dust. It's just absolute nonsense. Why did Cho, after the first shooting, make the video, as I stated, and then walk around the school to send it to NBC, and then go to the second shooting. Uh, he seemed to not be in any hurry, worrying about being apprehended before he completed his mission, after which time he was supposedly planning to commit suicide. N none of this stuff adds up. Uh, when Cho's body was found, his ID was present. So why is it that his identity was... Uh, was reported, uh, or wasn't reported until later on. You know, his ID was right there on him. Why did it take so long? They should have known right away who he was. Uh, anyway, lots more inconsistencies. I hope I get time to finish this up before the guest comes. If not, I'll pick it up on uh, Thursday. Stick with us, folks. Be right back. All right, folks. Back on True Thirds Radio. Got a final segment here for this first hour, and then I'll be bringing my guest on, hopefully, anyway. Uh, here's another inconsistency. The photos sent to NBC do not even match Cho's face. The eyebrows, eyes, and face shape, for example, do not look like earlier pictures of Cho. It's not the same person, folks. Cho's body was found with the 28 dead bodies in the classroom. The only survivor of this massacre stated that the killer ran off after completing his rampage. Do you see the problem? The only survivor in the classroom that wasn't killed that morning, or afternoon by this time, whatever, uh, almost afternoon, I guess it was around 10 or 11. But anyway, the only survivor of the second uh, rampage said that the killer ran off, but yet Cho's body was found in the classroom with the other uh, dead students. Come on. Uh, the classroom dormitory, hallways, school gate, gun shop, uh, closed circuit TV footage, etc., were not shown to the public. Why? All of this information. No, th th this is, again, a classic PSYOPs job, folks. This is what happens. The FBI is there on the scene seizing surveillance tapes. Uh, they're not collecting evidence to assist in their investigation. They're collecting evidence to destroy it, to hide what really went on. They always do. Anyway, uh, eyewitness Matt Kazi stated that it was a full two to three hours after the shootings began that loudspeakers installed around the campus were used to warn students to stay indoors and that a shooter was on the loose. What was going on here? He stated that it was a full two to three hours after the shootings began. Can you believe this? You know, this is like on 9-11, uh, uh, a voice being heard over the uh, cell tower loudspeakers telling everybody to remain calm, stay in your offices, everything's fine, when it was known that a second hijacked plane was heading toward New York. Unbelievable. It was known that a second plane was heading toward them, and they were told, remain calm, stay in your eye. Remain calm, everybody. We want the maximum amount of deaths so we can get the maximum shock effect to sucker you to fight our wars and to give up your liberties when we pass things like the Patriot Act, okay? So please cooperate. We want as many of you to die as possible. You know, just like the Lusitania. You know, the, the, the German government was sending uh, mercenaries to the dock there to warn people, uh, you know, not to board. And yet the U.S. government was saying, oh, no, no, this is propaganda, war propaganda. Don't listen to the Germans. The German government had more compassion and concern 
about American citizens uh, than the American government did. They wanted the maximum death toll. Uh, anyway, uh, how the killer was allowed so much time, folks, before any action was taken to stop him is absolutely baffling, especially considering the fact that the campus, according to Kazi, the same eyewitness, uh, was crawling with police before the event even happened due to numerous bomb threats, uh, you know, that had been phoned in the previous week. One student, Jason, uh, Jason uh, Piat, told CNN, uh, and I quote, What happened today, this was ridiculous, and I'll say on the record, I'm pretty outraged that someone died in a shooting in a dorm at 7 o'clock in the morning, and the first email about it, no mention of locking down campus, no mention of canceling classes, they just mention that they're investigating a shooting two hours later at 9.22. That's pretty ridiculous. And meanwhile, uh, while they're sending out the email, 22 more people got killed. Uh, very ridiculous indeed. The shootings came three days after a bomb threat forced the cancellation of classes in three buildings, uh, WDBJ in Roanoke had reported. Also, the 100,000 square foot uh, Torgerson Hall was evacuated April 2nd after police received uh, a written bomb threat, the Roanoke Times reported. On and on it goes, folks. Just one major problem after another. Initial reports suggested there were two shooters, but the story quickly changed to just one shooter who later killed himself. Uh, as happens in almost all these cases, folks, or that he was shot by police. Uh, once again, initial reports. You know, it's like the Oklahoma City bombing. Initial reports stated, local reports, that there was more than one bomb. And there was. Got a show coming up, up on that sometime. But uh, in the national news, nope, only one bomb. That's it. Uh, eyewitness accounts describe police hiding behind trees and failing to pursue the killer while ordering the school to be placed on lockdown so that nobody could escape the carnage as the killer picked off his targets uh, with seemingly little interruptions from police. You know, this makes me think of the uh, WTO protests in 1999 in Seattle where police were told to stand down. People were ringing the police uh, phones off the hook and no responses were made. They didn't even answer the phones. Uh, you know, people were having their windshields smashed, their uh, front store windows broken, you know, with uh, batons. It turns out, this emerged later, and this was covered in the local press, it didn't make the national news, but the federal government told the police not to break ranks at the hotel where the guests were staying for the WTO meetings. Uh, and... Uh, in the meantime, they hired some black bloc thugs to infiltrate the legitimate, legitimate peaceful protesters to make it look like they were rebel rousers. And so they were able, without any police intervention, to smash, you know, property, destroy property. Uh, you know, there were people in the local news, legitimate protesters, peaceful protesters, who were saying, we have nothing to do with these uh, violent outrages. We're disgusted that these people are here. Uh, you know, we're not associated with them at all. They were wearing black ski masks. It emerged that later they were awarded free government housing. They were street people. Uh, they were awarded free housing by HUD for cooperating and uh, making the legitimate protesters look bad. Oh, this crap goes on all the time, folks. Anyway, on July 5, 2007, the New York Times reported that Kenneth Feinberg, uh, the lawyer whom John Ashcroft appointed, to head up the federal program to compensate, i.e. bribe family members of 9-11 victims, would also be overseeing the distribution of a $7 million fund uh, donated to Virginia Tech for family members of the VA Tech shootings. Now, isn't that interesting? The same guy. Uh, I wonder if there was a condition for the receipt of this money, too, as there was for the 9-11 compensation fund. Uh, the condition was, don't sue anybody, the government or any security companies or, or, or airline companies involved in the 9-11 attacks. 
Promise us here on paper with your signature that you're not going to sue anybody, and we'll give you $1.8 million. Unfreaking believable. So I wonder if these family members of the victims of uh, the VA tech shootings were, were also given conditions. Well, it appears so, because notice this. The New York Times went on to say, quote, Mr. Feinberg said he plans to disseminate a set of proposals about distributions to the families in mid-July. He will establish criteria for eligibility by the end of the month, and he plans to finish distributing money before Thanksgiving, he said. Well, 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 there we go. This is the same, oh, can I say it on air? This is the same bastard who came up with the criteria for family members of 9-11 victims to receive their compensation. Oh, don't, don't sue anybody now and we'll give you the money. You can bet. I, I don't know of any report that ever came out about what these stipulations were, but here's the New York Times stating that this same bastard lawyer had criteria for the family members to receive this money. I, I can guarantee you, folks, that criteria was the same with 9-11. Uh, compensation fund money. Keep your mouths shut. Don't question anything. Go along with the official story that we suckered the public into believing, and we'll give you your money. This is an outrage. Unbelievable. Oh, folks, can anybody say inside job? Can anybody say CIA PSYOPs operation? Oh, yeah. Langley isn't too far away now, is it, from uh, VA Tech? All right, guys, short break. Uh, hopefully my guests will be coming on the second hour. Uh, stick with us. Be right back. All right, guys. The second hour of our broadcast here. You know, I forgot to mention uh, another very bizarre event occurred at Virginia Tech last year. Uh, less than two years after the Cho incident, or what we were told was the Cho incident. Anyway, uh, also at Virginia Tech, on January 21st, 2009, uh, Xin Yang was stabbed and beheaded by another Chinese student, a doctoral student at that, uh, in a campus cafeteria. Very, very strange. Uh, was this another PSYOPs operation? Perhaps we'll never know. Uh, if anybody has any information on that, uh, by all means, send it to uh, Truth Hurts Radio at AOL.com, spelling Hurts, H-E-R-P-Z. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to know about it. I haven't been able to dig up anything on that. Uh, not much was reported on it. In fact, it didn't get much fanfare at all. That's major news, especially where two you know, less than two years early, you had the big shootout there at Virginia Tech. That was squashed down. Uh, so, I don't know. Then, of course, it involved a knife not a gun. Maybe that was a legitimate student going off the, the wire. I don't know. But um, just interesting that it was at the same school, you know, less than two years later. Just, just bizarre stuff. Anyway, let's um, move on here to a different topic. I guess my guest, uh, I sent him a confirmation email, as he asked me to do, uh, but uh, I don't see him calling in. And, uh, you know, I've interviewed him before and never had a problem. So I'm assuming something major must have come up. He is a lawyer. He's probably uh, got a lot of commitments and something must have come up. I do apologize. I'll see if I can get him on again sometime, folks. Uh, this does happen, unfortunately, from time to time. With me lately, it seems to be quite a bit, but, you know... <laughs> it's nothing new. I, I've had this, uh, you know, I've, been, I've seen this for years. Like I said, you know, you're lucky if... Uh, 60% of the time your guests show up. Uh, it's kind of a luck of the draw thing. Anyway, uh, but yeah, William Pepper was supposed to be the guest. I'm sure he would have called him by now if that was going to be the case. So I'll go off on to uh, another discussion here. Um, let's take a look at the number 33, which of course is uh, you know the highest degree in Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Uh, it's a very powerful number in the occult world. We see this number popping up all over the place. I was with a friend of mine just the other day. We took a ride up and spent the day up in uh, Portland, Maine. Beautiful, uh, beautiful city up there. Oceanside City. Anyway, we're on our way up, and uh, right there on the highway, 
uh, this truck, you know, pulls up um, a side of us. I look out, and uh, it had 33 written on the side of it, on the back of it. And then we circled around it later into, you know, the, the first lane to check, you know, the other side. And sure enough, on that side, it had the same, nothing else was written on it. But what was strange about it is, uh, well, I'll get to that when we get back. Yeah, break the coast, folks. Okay, folks, back. As I mentioned before the break, let's take a look at the number 33. Uh, yeah, before I launch into this, I just wanted to mention this truck. It was the weirdest thing. Couldn't really see the driver. Uh, two windows were, were dark on either side. And um, he sped off pretty quick, so we couldn't pull ahead of him to uh, see him from the front. It, I just I never seen anything like it. It had uh, just the number 33, but the first three was facing the right way. The other three was facing the opposite way. Um, it's very bizarre. Uh, we did take a picture. Had a camera on us. Did snap a picture of it. Anyway, the number 33 pops up, folks, all over the place. Sometimes it's uh, a little subtle. It's disguised, but uh, it, it's everywhere. Not only the, um, the number itself, but, you know, buildings that have 33 floors or number 33, uh, you know, on a street, very important building, you know, uh, like usually banks, interestingly enough, or Masonic lodges. Um, it allegedly represents uh, selfless devotion to the spiritual progress of humankind, at least uh, that's what we're told. I'm sure it has other more sinister uh, applications that uh, we're not told about. The other two... Uh, master numbers in Freemasonry, of course, are 11, standing for vision, we're told, and 22, vision with action. Uh, and they form the base of a two-dimensional pyramid uh, and add it together equal 33, of course, guidance to the world, the apex uh, of the pyramid. Um on the reverse of the um, Masonically inspired Great Seal of the United States, of course, is the pyramid with the all-seeing eye of divine reason at its apex. Uh, both in modern and ancient times, important buildings, uh, cities, and other constructions have been erected on the 33rd parallel. I think I, I did a show. Uh, yeah, I did. I did a show not too long ago on how... Uh, you know, death rows uh, in this country and uh, in other countries around the world, you know, uh, are in states or, or countries that the 33rd parallel passes through. A lot of assassinations of important dignitaries have occurred on the 33rd parallel. But anyway, let's take a look at um, some of these sites, beginning by uh, looking at some odd coincidental incidences where the number 33 pops up uh, outside of um, the uh, 33rd parallel. Anyway, let, let's look at uh, uses of this word in the, in the Bible uh, to start off with. We're told that King David ruled in Jerusalem for 33 years. We're told that Jacob had 33 sons and daughters. We're told that Christ uh, was apparently crucified at the age of 33. Uh, that's what most put it at anyway, if you look at events in his life, the, the, the way the time factor works out, it appears that he was in fact 33 when he died. Um, let's look at some examples from Dante. The late 13th, early 14th century uh, Italian poet, um, he ended Canto 33 of the Purgatorio or the second section of his Divine Comedy, with these words, perfect, pure, and ready for the stars. Canto 33 of the Parad uh, Paradiso, or the third section, concludes with lines about the poet being uh, turned, quote, as in a wheel, 
whose motion nothing jars by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Interesting correlation here with those two verses. Um, so it's more than just a coincidence, folks, that the 33rd canto of each section concludes with parallel lines regarding these, uh, the celestial you know, the stars. Uh, it may indeed be the code from a lost ancient tradition that they're echoing. You know, we know the basins are big on that. Uh, how about in biology? There's uh, 33 is the number of turns in a complete sequence of DNA. That's interesting. This number pops up uh, in the natural world as well. Uh, how about in the elements? The 33rd element of the periodic table is arsenic. Uh, it's a brittle steel gray substance that is actively poisonous. The Greek root arson means male, strong, or beryl. Uh, about in ancient sites, um, many ancient sites around the world are on the 33rd parallel. So this might actually be some ancient uh, long lost tradition or at least long lost to the general public. Masons probably know what it's all about. Uh, let's look at some examples. Um, the first one we'll look at is uh, the metropolis of Phoenix, Arizona, located at 33 degrees, 30 minutes latitude. Uh, this modern American city lies um, in a brown cloud of uh, auto exhaust at the northern end of the Sonoran Desert. In essence, uh, Phoenix is pervaded with an aura of the foreign and the bizarre. Few coastal tourists realize, however, that this was once the center of the ancient uh, Hohokam culture. So there we go. This is by chance that the Hohokam tribe had the epicenter of their culture. Uh, located on the 33rd parallel. The largest Hohokam site, known as uh, Snake Town, was located about five miles north of the exact 33rd degree line, while the ruins of the astronomical observatory called Casa Grande still rests about five miles south of the line. The Hohokam uh, inhabited the Valley of the Sun perhaps as early as 300 B.C., about the time of Alexander the Great and the uh, Ptolemaic dynasties in Egypt, and built one of the world's most extensive irrigation systems, as did the, uh, the Maya as well. You wonder who copied from who there, uh, or for that matter, where they even got it from. The Maya and the Hohokam, where did they get this from? Anyway, these ancient American Indians created an estimated total of 50 miles of canals to irrigate over 25,000 acres in the Phoenix Basin, all constructed uh, with mere digging sticks, stone implements, and woven carrying baskets, or at least that's what we're told. Who knows if they had a more advanced technology than that. Anyway, guys, uh, we'll pick up there when we get back. Lots of ancient cities located on the 33rd parallel. Really strange stuff. All right, folks. Shirts Radio. By the way, if anybody wants the transcripts for this or any other topic I've covered, they can just email me at truthhurtsradio at aol.com, spelled hurts, H-E-R-T-C. Uh, and if you get any ideas or information you don't want to share, you know, that uh, I can use on the air, always looking for new ideas, uh, send it away, I'd like to get it. Anyway, we just looked at uh, Phoenix, Arizona, the site of the ancient Hohokam uh, epicenter of their culture, located on the 33rd degree parallel. Uh, let's look at another one. At latitude 33 degrees 19 minutes was located the primary Phoenician seaport of Tyre, now called uh, Sur, almost 50 miles south of Beirut. Uh, it dated back as early as 5000 BC. Tyre was renowned for its uh, purple dye obtained from snails of the genus Murex. Um, 
that's where they got the name from. Phoenician means purple or, or the purple people. The Phoenician, uh, uh, the Phoenicians were a, a very competent seafaring culture, very big on trade. They extended all over the Mediterranean, uh, up and down the west coast of, uh, of Europe. Uh, you know, out of you know to India, China, and of course, uh, believe it or not, the Americas as well. I've got some shows coming up uh, at a later time on that. Absolutely fascinating. The evidence of Phoenician uh, trading over here is is everywhere present. Uh, you know, they they found Phoenician inscriptions uh, down in South America. In Brazil, for example, uh, in Peru, up in uh, Maine, off the coast of Maine, was a, a small island uh, where they actually found uh, some Ogam inscription that says Phoenician trading port. Uh, so the evidence is uh, it's overwhelming. If, you know, for, that, for those that have an open mind, open enough to you know take a look at it, the evidence is uh, it abounds. But again, mainstream academia, like so many other things, uh, hides the truth from people. Also near the 33rd parallel is uh, Byblos, a bit farther north of Tyre, uh, at a latitude of 34 degrees 08 minutes. So a little bit off, but uh, close enough. Major cities, ancient cities, either right on the 33rd parallel or very close to it. Uh, a bit further east, at nearly the same latitude is Baalbek uh, in modern-day Lebanon. Baalbek contains uh, the largest, most heaviest stones of uh, human construction in the world. Uh, one block measuring uh, 80 feet long and weighing 1,100 tons uh, is among the largest there. Just absolutely phenomenal. Think about it, 80 foot long stone block, 1,100 tons. You know, how did they move that sucker? Um, it's anybody's guess, but they did do it. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, let's move on, uh, talk about um, uh, Babylon at 33 degrees 20 minutes, uh, which of course is located in modern uh, Baghdad and Iraq. Um, God knows what's left of it now, of course, uh, with the Iraq War of 2003. Uh, they've devastated a lot of the ruins of Baghdad. They actually used a lot of the ruins of Babylon, I should say. They actually used the uh, the site as a military base, and as far as I know, they still are using it. Uh, but during shock and awe, you know, the U.S. had uh, a lot of uh, their munitions... Uh, stationed there. A lot of their troops were, were posted there. And a lot of the ruins there were destroyed. And that's very interesting because during the 91 Gulf War, Daddy Bush accused Saddam of hiding weapons in the ruins, figuring that uh, the claim was that that was a sleazy tactic because they figured that we wouldn't use that as a target. You know, we wouldn't uh, destroy this priceless treasure. And yet here we were in 2003 doing that very thing ourselves. Unbelievable. How disgusting, folks. But hey, why not? They looted the Baghdad Museum before that, so, uh, well, you know, why not destroy the, the actual ruins of the city when they looted the museum? Disgusting bunch of pigs. Anyway, <clears throat> this ancient capital of uh, Mesopotamia, on the banks of the Euphrates uh, River, was once the largest city in the world encompassing over 2,500 acres. It's uh, pretty enormous. The construction of Babylon began during the 23rd century B.C. and included the temple of Marduk, known as uh, Esagila, as well as the legendary Tower of Babel. So, there you go. Another famous, another very important city ancient city located uh, on or at least near the 33rd parallel. Um, anyway, let's move on to, uh, to China here. There's a fabulous white pyramid located about 60 miles southwest of Xi'an or Cyan uh, in the 
Qin Ling Shan Mountains of China's uh, Shenxi province. So here again, we see another example. Uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but uh, there's many pyramids in ancient China. Google that, uh, you can see pictures of them. Quite different looking from, you know, the, China, the, the uh, Egyptian pyramids or the Mexican pyramids, but pyramids nonetheless. Uh, in fact, there's really no major part of the world that doesn't have pyramids, ancient pyramids. Makes you wonder what was up with that. This was a common feature in all cultures. A lot of them shared, you know, similarities, but uh, there were also some things that were quite different about them from one culture to the next. But again, pyramids. Almost always they had uh, four sides. Sometimes they were stepped pyramids, sometimes they were flat-sided, sometimes they had temples on top, other times they had no temple at all. But nevertheless, uh, you know, they, they all had pretty much four sides. In fact, I don't know of any pyramids that... Uh, had any less or more than that, uh, four-sided. Uh, there's a pyramid on Mars that has five sides. That's another story. That's for another show. But, uh, yeah, all the ancient cultures had four-sided pyramids. What was up with that? Some were used as burials. Maya, for example, you know, Pakal. Uh, uh, you know, that was, a, that was an obvious tomb. They found uh, the king's body right there in the Temple of the Inscriptions. And, uh, you know, it's rumored that that was the case in Egypt, although there really hasn't ever been, in fact, there hasn't ever been any mummies found in a pyramid. The argument is, oh, they were looted in ancient times. And, well, that might be, but, uh, you know, when these broke in, they weren't going after mummies. They were going after treasures. They would have left the mummies. Uh, we don't have, not only have we never found any burials in the Egyptian pyramids, but we don't have any record of any mummies ever being found. So, who knows? Who knows what the real function was? There's a lot of interesting theories, and on future shows I'll delve into that. But anyway, so here's another uh, interesting ancient site on the 33rd parallel. We find it now in ancient China. This was common around the world. Okay, guys, have a short break. Stick with us. Be right back. All right, guys. So we've talked about some ancient cities on the 33rd parallel. Let's look at some other uh, bizarre appearances of this number. Uh, Highway 33. 1,500 miles east of Phoenix, along latitude 33 north, lies the Moundville site, lying exactly on the line. This city, constructed by the Mississippian culture, along the Black Warrior River in central Alabama, which was inhabited from uh, 1000 to 1450 A.D., had a population of uh, over 1,000, uh, second in size and complexity to ancient uh, Cahokia in Illinois. The uh, 26 earthen Platform mounds arranged in a circular pattern are similar in structure to those in Arizona's Valley of the Sun with temples and residences for the elite priesthood, likewise built on top. Uh, one of the larger mounds is a ramped pyramid that rises to a height of 58 feet. So this is quite a significant site as well, another ancient site. Um... Let's see here. Oh, I guess I have a bunch of other ancient cities listed here. I thought I was done looking at ancient cities on the 33rd parallel, but uh, approximately 10 miles southwest of the town of Lake Providence, 32 degrees, 49 minutes, on the Mississippi River floodplain in uh, northeastern Louisiana is Poverty Point State Historic Site, another one associated with the 33rd parallel. You know what, folks, it took me all this time to realize, I guess, um, I thought the show I was sharing with you was uh, bizarre occurrences of the number 33, but it's not. It's uh, This whole show is ancient sites on the 33rd parallel. Uh, don't mind me, I'm half asleep today. I actually picked this at the last minute, uh, realizing my guest wasn't going to show up, and I thought it was another show. 
I do have a show that deals just with the number 33 and all of the strange uh, occurrences of it. But, uh, no, this one is just ancient sites. But that's cool. Um, this is a fascinating subject. And so you got to wonder why so many sites right on the 33rd parallel. Uh, so many ancient sites. You know, what was up with this? Were the ancients on to something here? Um, did they hold the number 33 in high esteem? You'd also have to ask, of course, uh, you know, what, what, um, senior moment here. Anyway, you know, what was the significance that they saw in it? And what is the significance that Freemasonry now sees in it? Is it the same thing? Uh, you know, does Freemasonry know something that uh, they're not sharing with us? Of course, we know there's a whole lot of things Freemasonry knows they're not sharing with us. Uh, and all the other secret societies like Skull and Bones, you know, when uh, John Kerry was asked by Tim Russert, um, forget the exact question now, it was pertaining to the upcoming, uh, you know, election and the debates. And um, Anyway, he brought up Skull and Bones, I guess. And he says, can you tell us about it? What's the matter? Is it a secret? And then he laughs and he says, oh, well, there's a whole lot of secrets, uh, Tim. Uh, you know, so there you go. Uh, you know, ultimately, they're probably the ones that looted the Baghdad Museum, you know, the Treasures are probably in the hands of Skull and Bones members. Um, and going back, you know, to the World War II when they bombed in Berlin, the treasures of the Berlin Museum disappeared at that time. Of course, they told us that, oh, they were destroyed during the bombing. Hogwash. Somebody walked away with those treasures, folks. In fact, some of them have uh, surfaced in more recent years. The famous uh, Amber Room that was in uh, St. Petersburg, um, from, uh, you know, Peter the Great, from his palace there. It was one room that was almost completely made of uh, amber. Very beautiful, exquisite uh, designs. Some of the panels have recently, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, they turned up at some auction or whatever. Some private collector was auctioning them off, I guess. So, I mean, you know... So much for the treasures being destroyed. We know they weren't destroyed. Somebody stole them. Somebody, you know, high profile, of course, i.e., uh, was a government operation. They do this all the time, folks. They use war as a cover uh, to loot treasures from uh, these museums. The treasures of Troy, of course, were in that collection. Uh, you know, those have disappeared. They weren't destroyed. They weren't bombed. They're somewhere. I'm sure our little friends in the secret societies know exactly where they are. Anyway, let's go on to uh, some more ancient sites here on the 33rd, or at least near the 33rd uh, parallel. Uh, even closer to the magic number 33, though not as impressive or as old, are the uh, Winterville Mounds, located six miles north of the town of Greenville in uh, west-central Mississippi. 30 de 33 degrees, uh, 25 minutes. Inhabited between 1000 A.D. and 1450 A.D., the site includes 23 flat-top mounds uh, with the main temple mound rising 55 feet. About four, uh, four miles south of uh, Cartersville in northwestern Georgia, 34 degrees, 11 minutes, is uh, Estoa Indian Mound State Park. Um, white settlers understood the creek and the later Cherokee to call this site High Tower, possibly for Itawa or Itawa City. The name uh, Itawa may also be a corruption uh, of, of this word, this Native American word. Anyway, it's interesting to note that the Hopi word for the sun deity is Tawa, Another connection, a linguistic connection. The tower was first inhabited in 950 A.D. and contains uh, three major mounds. Uh, one is uh, a ceremonial mound 63 feet in height. And another is um, 
a burial mound in which were found numerous artifacts, including copper ear ornaments, uh, stone effigies, and seashells, which were, you know, a form of money, along with obsidian uh, and uh, you know, obsidian artifacts and grizzly bear teeth from the Rocky Mountains, quite a distance away. Obviously, the ancient Native Americans had a, an extensive trade network. And here you go with copper. Copper was pretty rare among the Native Americans, even though it was abundant uh, in this country, especially in the Great Lakes regions. Um, kind of getting sidetracked here, but this is interesting. My uncle, uh, actually, he's a second, second cousin. I call him uncle so much older than me since I was a kid, I called him uncle. But anyway, uh, there's a place down in Connecticut near uh, Hartford. Uh, he's got quite a few acres there, and he discovered years ago when he first moved there, he was digging a garden, he discovered uh, an Indian burial mound. Um, what he thought was a hill, he, you know, he's putting a garden up on top of this hill, it turns out to be a big burial mound. Anyways, he had some digs down there, and they found copper ingots, in the mound uh, that they traced back to the uh, the mines in uh, Michigan by the you know the Great Lakes, Lake Superior particularly. So there you go, folks. Um, uh, you know there was this extensive trade network. Copper all the way from Michigan made it out to Connecticut in about 2000 BC. That's where they uh, when they dated this to 4,000 years old. But again, copper was pretty rare among the natives. They had a, you know, a few trinkets were found here and there, but um, not enough anywhere near enough to account for the millions of pounds of copper that were removed in ancient times. I mentioned this in a previous broadcast. You know, huge copper mines uh, have been found all around the Great Lakes region, uh, dating back, you know, three, 4,000 years ago, 5,000 even. Uh, who was mining this copper and where did it go? Well, as I mentioned before, they found some of these ingots in the shape of ox hides, which was a very common uh, way to trade copper during the uh, Bronze Age in Europe. We found Ogam and other uh, European writings uh, in the area of these uh, copper mines. We've also found them all the way up, out, out here to New England. I mentioned the Phoenician trading port uh, written in Ogam script up in uh, off the coast of Maine. So... You know, plenty of evidence, folks, for ancient old world cultures having reached the Americas. All right, guys, short breaks to close. Be right back. All right, guys, for our final segment here. The whole reason I just went off on that tangent uh, is, um, you know, we, we've been talking about mounds, ancient mound cities located in the 33rd parallel. Uh, the mound cultures folks, or I should say the mound culture. Uh, I'm trying to remember now the, the name that they give them collectively. Um, well, mound builders anyway. Um, going back to the, you know, the woodland period. Uh, these were not Native Americans. Uh, at least not for the most part. Most of the mound builders were actually of a very large stature. The skeletons that uh, they dug out of these mounds are, you know, anywhere from uh, seven to nine feet tall, and some of them even taller than that. And they're of European stock. Uh, some of them have been preserved quite well, and they have reddish-colored hair, indicating they were probably Celtic or, uh, uh, you know, Norse or whatever, from the, you know, the Scandinavian uh, region of Europe. But uh, they weren't uh, Native American. In fact, many Native American tribes uh, state that, you know, that these were not our ancestors. You know, they came from across the Great Sea to the east, i.e. the Atlantic. So, you know, there's even more evidence there. Uh, and in some of these um, mounds, they've actually exhumed ancient uh, Old World writings, tablets with uh, Old World writings on them, so. You know, the evidence of this is overwhelming. Like I said, I've got whole shows uh, that I'll be doing on this, talking about this subject. Evidence of the uh, the Babylonians here, the Sumerians, the Greeks, the Romans, you name it. And But once again, you're, you're laughed at if you talk about this stuff. The halls of learning, the great halls of academia will uh, poke fun at you and say you don't know what you're talking about. It, it's unbelievable. By the way, 
isn't that just the most incredibly childish tactic? Isn't it, isn't it quite obvious what we're dealing with here? These are supposed to be respectable scientists, and uh, they were literally like kindergartners uh, who get caught doing something naughty in school, uh, you know, by, by another student, you know, to, to discredit what the other student uh, who witnessed them doing this is saying about them, you know, they'll they'll just make fun of them and uh, try to, you know, make themselves look innocent. We see this in our respected halls of learning. They'll act, they literally will poke fun of you. They'll attack you in the prestigious journals, uh, but they won't meet you head on and debate with you. They won't address the evidence. They'll just say, oh, it's a forgery. And yet evidence is overwhelming. A lot of the evidence is actually in major museums that shows contact. Uh, the Smithsonian has a lot of this stuff. The famous Bat Creek uh, stone, this was exhumed from a, a mound in uh, Tennessee. And um, for the longest time, you know, nobody recognized it for what it was. It was being displayed at the Smithsonian upside down. One day, I think his name was Siren Gordon or Siren Vance or whatever. Yeah, Siren Gordon, I think it was. He, he was in the Smithsonian. And, you know, he had access. He was a, a linguistic uh, professor, uh, a master of, you know, ancient languages. He helped to crack a lot of the, the ancient Mayan glyphs. What little we know about them today is mostly because of him. Anyway, um, he had access, you know, to the, these artifacts. So he, he opened the case up, and he tipped the uh, Bat Creek stone upside down, and he realized, son of a gun, this is Hebrew. It's ancient Hebrew, and he, he, he translated it. So um, there you go. You know, major prestigious uh, uh, museums have a lot of these artifacts. Sometimes they don't know what they are. Other times, you know, they'll suppress it, uh, have it in the back room somewhere. But, um, you know, it gets me that it's even admitted that the Norse were here long before Columbus. 500 years, in fact, before him. That's admitted. And yet they still suppress this. They don't talk about it. It's not... For the most part, it's not even in, in, the, in the textbooks. Anyway, let's look at some other ancient sites on the 33rd parallel. Uh, closer to the home of the Hohokam, on the uh, western side of the Colorado River, are located a number of geoglyphs, also called uh, intaglios. Uh, these figures formed in the desert by removal of darker pebbles, kind of like what you have down in uh, you know the Nazca Desert. Uh, those carvings there in the desert. Uh, you remove the pebbles and it reveals a lighter uh, under surface. Uh, there's sometimes hundreds of feet in length. Uh, anyway, a lot of people don't realize we got the same thing over in uh, Colorado. Was it the same culture that uh, created the desert drawings in uh, the Nazca Plain in Peru? Who knows? Anyway, um, this is also at 33 degrees, 40 minutes latitude. Um, and, you know, I, I'm skipping through a lot of these notes. We just don't have the time here. But, uh, once again, anybody wants to read through this, I've got tons of information about this culture here, possible connections with the, the Nazca drawings. Just request the transcripts. I'll send them to you. Um Let's see. Midway uh, on Spirit Road between the Sacred Mountain of the North and the mouth of the Colorado River um, are some more glyphs, 33 degrees, uh, right, at, right at 33rd, the 33rd parallel. Also on this line is the Three Rivers Petroglyph Site located on the western base of the Sacramento Mountains, 18 miles west of... Uh, Rodoso, New Mexico, 33 degrees, 19 minutes. So, um, another site on the 33rd parallel. Uh, and again, there's a lot of other information here on that site. I'm not going to take the time. don't have the time. Near Gila Bend, Arizona, about 62 miles west of um, Snake Town, is uh, Painted Rocks State Park which has thousands of petroglyphs of similar designs, uh, not actually painted, but pecked into the boulders. Again, folks, the 33rd 
parallel site. Uh, there's a fascinating site also in the general vicinity of uh, Phoenix called Circle Stone Observatory, 33 degrees, 28 minutes. Why are all these significant sites on the 33rd parallel? Uh, and again, is this why so many important Masonic sites and events have occurred on the 33rd parallel of modern times? Uh, by the way, the site I just mentioned incorporates the golden ratio, which is 1 to 1.618. I've got uh, several shows coming up on that sometime. Uh, that's fascinating. The golden ratio, look that up. How it pops up all over the place in art, in music, uh, in ancient sites, but also, interestingly enough, in the natural world. Uh, let me just whet your, your appetite for that uh, by giving you one example. Interestingly enough, the bones in the hand, uh, if you pick any finger at random, let's say your middle finger, and you look at the first digit, which really is inside the palm of your hand, it's 1.618 times the length as the second digit in that finger. And then that one is 1.618 times the length of the next digit in that finger. And then, of course, that's 1.618 times the length of the final digit. You can do that with all your fingers. It's the same. Not only that, but the length of your arm. If you go from, uh, let's see, i got to get this right. If you go from the tip of your middle finger to your wrist, and then from your wrist to your elbow, the wrist to your elbow is 1.618 uh, times the length as from your wrist to the tip of your middle finger. And likewise, um, from your shoulder to your elbow, and then uh, from your elbow to your wrist, your elbow to your wrist is 1.618 times the length as the upper part of your arm to your elbow from your, uh, I mean, from your elbow to your shoulder. Uh, we see this all over the place. I'll, I just threw that out there as one example. There's many more. I've got a whole show on it, so I won't go into it in any more detail now. But this is fascinating stuff. You know, things that make you go, hmm. You know, most people don't even think about this, don't even know about it, don't even seem to care. Uh, but this stuff fascinates me, you know, but why is that? Anyway, guys, I had a few more things to cover here. Some other sites on the 33rd parallel don't have time. But, uh, yeah, request the notes. You can take a look at it for yourself. Interesting stuff. All right, guys, that's it for today. I do have a guest. I'm going to make darn sure that uh, I confirm it uh, to make sure that they're on for tomorrow. So uh, we'll catch you then. I'll leave a surprise.